having fun throwing things on campus. <laughs> okay. All right, so what I want to do today is I want to continue with our work towards the Riemann mapping theorem. And so the Riemann mapping theorem is one of the central results in complex analysis. It says, you give me any nice, simply connected region that's not all the complex plane, and it is conformally equivalent to the unit disk. So not only do I have a mapping that's one-to-one -one and onto, but the map is infinitely differentiable. And in some special conditions, you can actually extend the map to the boundary. Absolutely shocking that you can do this infinitely differentiably. And of course, all these properties also hold for the inverse as well. So we talked a little bit about automorphism groups last time, and how if you understand one automorphism group, and you have a conformal map between two different sets, you can take knowledge of one automorphism group and migrate it to the other. What we want to understand now is a couple of different maps. So I wrote down a couple of maps that I think are worth studying. So let's study e to the iz. So the question is, what does e to the iz do? And is there a subset of the complex plane which would be good to study e to the iz on? So think about this. Where should I really concern myself with studying e to the iz? What's set? What should be the natural input? Should it be the entire complex plane? The unit disk. I'm sorry? The unit disk. So the unit disk is one possibility. I don't think it's the right possibility here. And there's a natural reason. So if I write z is x plus i y, then e to the i z is e to the i x e to the minus y. So a disk of radius pi? I don't think disk is the right... Okay, we may not have seen them too much in this class, but there are other shapes than disks and half disks. And it's quarter disks. I know, I know. They, they won their court case, they were allowed to come into the class. You can't have something that is not a disk. Line? Well, line is one dimensional, so... I'm sorry? Lower half plane. Lower half plane, okay, so what kind of shape is a lower half plane? Square box, rectangle, something like that. To get four sides, one of them off at infinity. I claim that there's a very natural rectangle to study this on. What would be a natural rectangle? I would say width. 2 pi, not height 2 pi. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because you get e to the i x. What happens every time I increase x by 2 pi? It repeats. It repeats. So if I'm going to try to understand this map, do I need to understand this map on the whole complex plane? No. I need to understand it on a certain region. And so maybe I take minus pi less than x less than pi, or maybe 0 less than x less than equal, I'm sorry, less than 2 pi, something like that. And then, of course, the question is less or less than or equal to? Less. They're both equal to. Isn't zero and two pi kind of the same? So. Doesn't it need to be uh, an open set? So I want open set. So maybe I take two less thans, or maybe one of them is a less than and one of them is less than or equal to. So we'll have to think about this in a moment. Okay? So now, if I look at what's going on, Let's say here's 0, here's 2 pi. For now, we won't worry about what we do on the boundaries. We now have a really nice map. If we are in the lower half plane, then y is going to be negative, so it's going to map it to something that's going to be positive. If we're in the upper half plane, then y is going to be positive, this is going to map to something that's really small. <coughs> what kind of... So this is going to control the magnitude. This is going to control the angle. And as x goes from 0 to 2 pi, all possible angles are hit. Are all possible radii hit? Let's say I want a radius of e to the 20th. If I want a radius of e to the 20th, I just take y to be negative 20. If I want a radius of e to the negative 15, I just take y plus 15. As I range in this space, I get all possible radii, 
as I arrange this way, I get all possible angles. What does it look like this is mapping to? It looks like it's mapping to the whole plane. Is it mapping to the whole plane? Or was I a little cavalier? Infinity is little. Ah, but infinity is not in the plane. <laughs> it's just everywhere. Zero. I'm sorry? Zero. Excellent. It's not mapping to zero. So this gets mapped to the punctured disk. Now the question is, do we get the boundary? I'm oh, sorry, the, the punctured complex plane. The punctured complex plane. So it basically maps it to everything but the origin. Do I need to include these boundaries over here? Or do I lose something if I don't include them? Well, we've already lost the origin. The origin's gone. Gone forever. What else would I lose if I don't have zero and two pi? So, the real I think I lose the real line. Right? I need this to get the real line. So if I don't include at least one of them, I've lost the real line. Because if I take x to be 0 or 2 pi, I have e to the 0, which is 1. That means my angle is real. And then this can either be, in fact, I think I'm going to lose just the positive reals. So I lose the positive reals if I don't include 0 and pi. Hey, that's kind of like a definition for logarithm. Right? So if I use this as my set, what I would have is it maps to, and I have everything else, I can define the logarithm. I have a nice, simply connected region. So if I use this as my open set, I actually have a definition for the logarithm. Unfortunately, it's not the definition we typically like. Because now I've thrown away the positives. But if we used this one, we'd be throwing away the negative real line. So this becomes a great way to map a vertical strip to a region where the logarithm is defined. So this is what you want to do. You want to get a sense of what different maps do. You know, what's the easiest map we can study? Where should we study it? There is no point in studying this outside of a window of length 2 pi about x, because the function repeats. If I understand what's going on here, I understand what's going on here. When you look at sines and cosines, do you really want to evaluate sine at you know, 15 pi over 3, also known as, I guess, 5? <laughs> right? You don't want to, there's no need to evaluate it at you know, 15 pi over 3. You only need to evaluate it between, say, minus pi and pi, or 0, 2 pi, some region of length 2 pi. Now, of course, when you're putting in arguments to it, you might end up having something that has an argument outside those ranges, and you just reduce, and that's how you evaluate things. Okay? Similarly over here, we would only want to study this function in this region. All right, the next map we want to study is the map z to the n. So again, in all of these, the first thing we want to figure out is where should we study them? We want to study f of z is z to the n. And so if I give you the input as r e to the i theta, I get r to the n, e to the i, n theta. I could also write this in terms of x plus i, y. Why am I not writing it in terms of x plus i, y? Easier to understand. Much easier to understand like this. Right? This, is, this is the case where we want to do things circularly. Right? If I tried to do things Cartesian, it would be an absolute nightmare. What this is saying is the map does the following. It changes the radius by raising it to the nth power, and it increases your angle by a factor of n. So now the question is, where do I want to study this function? Okay, so I could study it on the entire disk. And if it's a disk of radius 1, it will send it to a disk of radius 1. If it's a disk of radius 2, It'll send it to a disk of radius 2 to the n. Do I want to send it over the entire disk? Could you do it over the disk? Could you do it over like 2 pi over n? Yeah, I think that's what I would want to do here. 
and call this angle 2 pi over m. Because when I raise it to the nth power, this sector from 0 to 2 pi over n is now unwound and becomes the whole thing. And so I wouldn't, there's no need to study this on the whole disk. What I would do in that case is I would have n copies. So if I'm trying to get an injective map, I don't want two points sent to the same point. It's enough to understand what's going on in this region, and then I can understand what's going on in any other region. So now the question is, do I include the boundaries or not? You seem like you should include one of them. If I don't include one of them, I think I have trouble. Like, right? So if you want to include both of them. Well, if I include both of them, then it's no longer injective. Yeah. If I... So uh, I would say that for this one, we would probably want to do it like this, which is now uh, maybe like a generalized half open, half closed set. Is I need those points. Okay, so this is another one of the basic maps to study. What happens if I replace my function z with z to the n? Okay, the next ones to look at I'm going to skip and go straight to translations, dilations, and rotations. Because these can be done really fast. So f of z is z plus h. What does this do? <coughs> Ship things by h. Right. Basically, just picks everything up and moves at h units. This is not that complicated to study. What's the underlying space I should study this on? I think somebody said it. The entire plane. Okay, there's translations. The next is dilations. F of z is az. And let's say a is a positive real number. So what's the effect of that? Yeah, you know, if A is greater than 1, it stretches things. If A is less than 1, it contracts things. So if you think about what's going on, F of R e to the i theta goes to A R e to the i theta. You've basically rescaled your radius by factor of A. Where should I study this one? On C. Last and least are the rotations. F of z equals cz, where I can write c as e to the i theta. Now let's not do e to the i theta. Let's do e to the i p. And if I take this as my function, then f of r e to the i theta is going to be e to the i phi, r e to the i theta, which is r e to the i <coughs> theta plus phi. So when you write it like this, it should hopefully be clear what's going on. Your magnitude hasn't changed, but you've just rotated your angle by phi. And not surprisingly, that's why we call these rotations. What's the natural place to study these? I think I would say all of C as well. You rotate the whole plane. Okay. So you've read all of you've read all the parts of chapter eight you're supposed to have read by now. So you've read all the section on. They have a beautiful page in the book with all these different maps from these different regions. Uh, Wikipedia has a really nice page on this where they go through you know a lot of examples of conformal maps and the different regions. There's a couple of conformal maps I just want to highlight and give special attention to. And so, in some sense, I'm hoping right now that you forget some of what you've read so that you don't know where I'm supposed to be defining these functions. So I'm going to look at two functions. f of z is i minus z over i plus z, and g of w is i I think it's 1 minus w over 1 plus w. Yes. And hopefully I've got these right. Okay. 
Visa actually functions that fit into what we saw at the end of class on Monday. What did we see that looks like these? The matrix stuff. So this would be the matrix minus 1, I, 1, I. This would be the matrix minus I, I, uh, 1, 1. So we can actually interpret these in terms of matrices acting on numbers. I'm defining a map like this. So the question is, where should I study F? What is the natural set for F? Okay, so looking at this, we def okay, so we don't like z equals minus i. Why don't we like z equals minus i? Okay, so this is telling us where we study this function, we don't want to study it near z equals minus i. Because then it's not going to be holomorphic. So study f away from minus i. Okay. Of course, a good chunk of the complex plane is not minus i. <laughs> so can you localize a little bit more for me as to where I should study this? <clears throat> Or can you think of any interesting choices of z to take to try to understand? So I want to understand what this map does. Z equals i. So z equals i, okay. So f of i is? Okay. And if we calculate f of i is 0, what else maybe should we calculate? So i goes to 0. 0 goes to 1. Yeah, what does 0 go to? f of 0 is 1. Mm, okay. Mm. Any other numbers that might be worth calculating? What about as uh, z gets really, really large? So as z gets really, really large, then the i's don't really matter. Yeah, you get and it's approaching what? Minus yeah. The limit as the absolute value of z goes to infinity of f of z is minus 1. Okay, I would say we still don't have enough clues to understand what's going on. I need a lot more points to understand. Can you give me a nice subset of the plane that I could try to understand? So I could try to understand the unit disk. The upper half plane. I could try the upper half plane. So there's a very nice part of the upper half plane, the x-axis. What does this do to the x-axis? You can interpret the numerator. If we take the absolute value, let's say z equals x. Oh. Then f of x is going to be i minus x over i plus x. I'm basically seeing, if I look at the absolute value, this is the distance from x to i, this is the distance from x to minus i. What can you tell me about that? It's the same. It's the same. What's the absolute value? One. One. Ah! What do you think this map does to the real line? It maps to the unit disk. So now, here's the real line, here's the boundary of the unit disk. Do we get every element on the boundary of the unit disk? What, what element do we not get? We don't get... Um, I don't think it's negative i that we're missing. So why would we be missing a negative i? Well, it depends if the unit disk with that function. If negative i it doesn't exist, so we don't get it. No, but that, that's, the, that's for the input. We, oh, don't, we oh, don't want the input to be negative i. Oh, the input is the real i. Right. Oh, right. We don't get negative 1? We don't get negative 1. Negative 1 is the one value we don't get. And in fact, we talked about how as z goes off to infinity, we get closer and closer to minus 1. 
right? We don't get that point right there. And as you go off to positive infinity, uh, let, I forget if that's the top or the bottom, you can figure it out. Positive infinity is one way, negative infinity is the other. They're getting closer and closer and closer to zero. So as a nice exercise, show that this map takes the real line and maps it to every point other than your other than minus one. Are you surprised that it misses a point? So why are you not surprised? We, we've we've seen we've seen maps that haven't necessarily hit all the points, and we know that our map doesn't isn't the polymorphic at every point either. I know that's not actually where we're. Right, we're, we're we're away from the bad point. So if I want to consider R as a compact set, I need to add the point at infinity. I need to compactify it. The closed disk, the boundary of that is a compact set. And so to me, topologically, there should be some issue with mapping this in a one-to-one -one manner onto the boundary of the unit disk. You know, if you add in the point of infinity, then the point of infinity can go to minus one. And then everything is fine. Well, if I throw away that point of infinity, I shouldn't get the entire boundary of the unit disk. I should be missing something. Okay, so now the next question becomes, what happens uh, to other values of c? So let's say we keep looking in the upper half plane. So we're pretty confident now that it maps the boundary of the upper half plane to the boundary of the circle minus the point negative 1. What does it do elsewhere in the upper half plane? It's going to be inside. So it maps... The upper half plane like this, probably dwelling, but like this to the inside. And if you think about what we have, we have f of x plus i y is i minus x plus i y over i plus x plus i y. And we have y is greater than 0. So if you look over here, they both have real parts of the same magnitude. The numerator and the denominator, this is negative x, this is positive x, the real parts are the same magnitude. The imaginary part here is i minus y. There's a little bit of cancellation there in opposite directions. Over here, it's i plus y. This reinforcement. So looking at this, you can see it maps into something with absolute value less than 1. So the absolute value of, F of x plus i y is less than 1 if y is greater than 0. So it maps it inside the unit disk. Okay, so we've got a function now that maps inside the unit disk. What's the next natural question? Can we get outside the unit disk? So how would we get outside the unit disk? Split the lower plane. I'm sorry? We'd have to look at the lower plane. So, this should be a natural question that you ask. I have a map from the upper half plane to the unit disk. What do you want to know about this map? Does it include every point? Does it include every point? So how would you try to show that it includes every point? Yeah, so one thing is solve. You know, do we get all of the unit disk. And we write the unit disk like that. So all we have to do is solve W and D find Z in the upper half plane. So it's instead of all Z equals X plus I Y, Y greater than zero, such that I minus Z over I plus Z equals W, or omega, depending on how you're viewing that letter. How would we try to solve this? <coughs> okay. okay. So one thing is to try to do the algebra. Is there another way we could try to solve this? Inverse the matrix. 
Can you do that? So we haven't developed too much of the theory of the matrix transforms. Do you have an idea? Uh, use Roche's theorem. Use Roche's theorem, right? You should have Pavlovian responses for certain things, right? You see a product. Log. You see the Red Sox playing the Yankees. Red Sox, right? Yankees. <laughs> we'll, we'll work on it. There should be certain automatic responses. When you have a question in complex analysis that concerns, does this have a solution? Is there a root? What theorem do we know that allows us to understand roots? Rouchet's theorem. So whenever you have a question about roots, use Rouchet. Question on roots. Rouchet. Okay. We won't use Rouchet here, but that's an approach that you could try to use here. And say, well, you know, maybe I can choose a certain value. I'll know that this has a root, and then if I tweak my function a little bit, I can then prove that this one has a root as well, and get that it has to be a root. The idea is, can we just do the algebra directly, because it's not so bad. So I minus z equals w of i plus z. So if we bring the z over to the other side, we get i equals wi plus wz plus z. And I will write this in painful detail so that I do not make an algebra mistake. I will please be watching to make sure I do, I do not make an algebra mistake. We bring this over to the other side, and we get i times 1 minus w is w plus 1 times z. So we get z is equal to i 1 minus w over 1 plus w. Yes, good. That's exactly the spot response I wanted. So what were you doing? Yeah, that looks a lot like that function g that I wrote right next to f. <laughs> this is the other reason I wanted to do the algebra. Right? If I have a map from the upper half plane to the unit disk, and if it's a conformal equivalence, what should I also have? The inverse map. And that's going to be our function g. And so we'll often call this over here g of omega. We've just found the value of z. What happened? <coughs> what do we need to check? Okay, we either need to check that z is in the upper half plane, or I think better, uh, yeah, yes, we want to check z is in the upper half plane. So you give me a w in the unit disk, we need to make sure that z is in the upper half plane. So, must show w in d implies z is in h. How do we show something is in the upper half plane? The imaginary part is positive. So we have to show the imaginary part is positive. I could multiply by maybe the complex conjugate of this 1 minus w, I'm sorry, 1 plus w bar. Wait, what? Hmm. This is where a little bit more blackboard space would be nice, but oh well. Let's try to see. Is this in the upper half plane? And then this will lead nicely into our next set of maps. So we have z is i 1 minus w, 1 plus w, multiplied by 1 plus w bar, 1 plus w bar. So w bar is the complex conjugate of w. When I do this, I get i 1 plus w bar times 1 1 plus w times 1 plus w bar. What is that equal? <coughs> 1 plus the magnitude of w. Well, no, it's so, yeah. It would be i 1 plus w plus w bar plus the length of w squared. Okay? Now, what's nice is this is always going to be a real number here. Why should right? you talk to the 1? Sorry. I'm sorry? Why does the top go to 1? Oh, it doesn't. I haven't finished. Oh, and then we have, multiplying this part, so we would have 1 minus w plus w bar uh, minus <coughs> the length of w squared. 
So all I need to know is that this number is real. I just need to know is this number positive or negative. Positive. Good. Why? The reason it is. So w plus w bar is going to be less than 1. So it's 1 plus. No, w plus w bar, what if w is really close to negative 1? This could be really close to negative 2. It's just going to be 2 times the real component. So this, so w. 1 plus w plus w bar plus w squared is 1 plus 2 times the real part of w plus w squared. Now this is greater than or equal to 1 plus 2 real part of w plus real part of w squared. Hmm. Right? Because all I've done is I've made this a little bit smaller. Right? And now this is 1 plus the real part of w squared. Ah, squaring real numbers. What can you say if you square a real number? Positive. <coughs> nope. Non negative. Oh, yeah. But. Because the real part of w is less than 1, it can't be negative 1. That's the only danger. So this will be strictly greater than 0 as w is inside the disk. Yeah, come on. Okay? Right. Of course you're right, but... <laughs> yeah, I'm just like two steps ahead. <laughs> I'll give you one and a half. Okay, one and a half. One and a half steps ahead. All right. So again, you either enjoy algebra like this or you don't. I happen to kind of like this. I kind of find it a little soothing to just go through the argument and see this is a real number. And it's a positive real number. And in fact, I don't care what positive real number it is. All I have to do is figure out, is this quantity in the upper half plane? So once I know that this is a positive number that I'm dividing by, that's great. I don't care if I'm dividing by 6 or 16 or 16,000. It's not going to affect whether or not I'm in the upper half plane or not. Why don't you have to show that the top's positive too? Oh, now we're going to have to work with the top, absolutely. I'm saying, what is the effect of this bottom part here? I now just need to look at this top. And so because I have an I here, I just need to look at the real part of this. And you, what can I say about the real part of this? Well, I have 1 minus W squared. That's going to be less than 1. And it's going to be greater than 0. And over here, W bar minus W. Is that going to be real or imaginary? Imaginary. <coughs> so these two pieces give me something that's imaginary. And these two pieces give me a positive real. And so we just showed you know, this piece over here is positive real. I don't really have to say positive real, I can just say positive because. As soon as I say positive, it has to be real. But let's be redundant. All right, so let's be redundant. So this part here is imaginary. This two gives me a positive number. I multiply by i, so the imaginary part of this is greater than zero. It's in the upper half plane. So in the upper half plane. And that's what we wanted to show. Okay. So a lot of work, a lot of algebra, but we were able to show you get every point in the upper half plane. What would be a great exercise for you to do now? I'm sorry? Check the lower half. Check the lower half. And the lower half will have some issue. What do you think the lower half is being mapped to? Everything outside of it. Maybe everything outside. Not, not entirely clear. So it's not a bad idea to play games with what's going on in the lower half. The other thing is, could you make a Rouché argument work here? That, that's an interesting thing to try. Uh, I just, why did we, how do we conclude uh, that we're in the upper half plane? So this over here is positive, yeah. so it's not going to affect all, and I have an I over here, so I just need to know what's the real part here. Is the real part a positive number, in which oh, case I'm in the upper, or is the real part negative, in which case I'm in the lower? Okay. Real part is 1 minus <laughs> omega squared. Omega is less than one in absolute value because I'm in the unit disk. 
don't so, care about the imaginary plane. We don't care about the imaginary plane. Right. So we can now explicitly map the upper half plane inside the unit disk one to one onto conformally polymorphic derivative exists, inverse exists, inverse is differentiable, and in fact we can almost extend the map to be from boundary to boundary. The only thing we can't do is if we try to extend from boundary to boundary, we just miss this one point. So this gives you a sense of how much further do you expect to be able to push the Riemann mapping theorem. You know, again, once you have something, celebrate and then ask more from it. Can we? No. You know, I mean, if we had more time, we'd, we'd celebrate. I'd take out the M&Ms. We'd be joyous. The M&Ms will come at some point this semester. Okay. That's why you have to keep coming to class. But the question is, can we push the map to boundary to boundary? And the answer is no. In this case, there is no way to, to push it and extend the map to be from boundary to boundary. But we can get boundary to boundary except at one point. So maybe if we weaken our request, you know, can we extend the map to be from boundary to boundary minus a set of measures zero, minus finitely many points? Maybe something like that can hold. And the question becomes, you know, how far can we push the beam of map here? Right. And so I'm not going to do too much with the map G. Essentially, G is the inverse of the map we've just done here. So if you understand what we've just done, you understand G. What I want to do is I want to look at one more map uh, very explicitly. And this map is going to be extremely useful. Assume the absolute value alpha is less than 1. And set C alpha of Z is uh, alpha minus Z over 1 minus alpha bar times z. OK. So as always, first question is, where should I study this map? Any thoughts? Sorry? Yes? What's alpha bar? Alpha bar is the complex conjugate of alpha. Uh, <coughs> away from 1 over alpha? Yeah. <laughs> Definitely uh, away from 1 over alpha bar. Right? So we definitely don't want to be near 1 over alpha bar. Where is alpha? Where is one over alpha bar? Outside the unit disk. Let's study the unit disk. So if I write, I can write as alpha minus z over I'm going to just look at something related. If I look at this, I've decreased the real part because alpha is less than one. But if I look at what's going on, what can you tell me about the magnitude of this number? This is 1 over alpha bar. Right? This is just a quick heuristic. I've decreased the 1 and replaced it with alpha alpha bar. I've made the denominator maybe smaller. And now I have something that's a little bit greater than alpha bar. But maybe this tells me I'm not expecting to be too much outside of a circle of radius 1 over alpha bar. Maybe it's good to study this inside the unit disk. Now, if you try to look at the size of things, um, your alpha bar is less than 1 in absolute value. So just trying to get a sense of how big things could be. There's a lot of ways to study this function. I think one of the most interesting is to study f of z is, al is c alpha composed with c alpha of z. Mm -hmm. So it's c alpha of c alpha of z. Okay? Uh, this is going to be painful. Right? So I have c alpha. c alpha of z is alpha minus z over 1 minus alpha by z. Now I apply C alpha again. This is a great day for group work, right? Alpha minus Z 
over 1 minus alpha bar z all over 1 minus alpha bar alpha minus z over 1 minus alpha bar z. Okay. What should I do? How should I understand this? What should I do? Multiply by? By what? One minus alpha bar z. Yeah, clear, clear some of the denominator. Right? Multiply by 1 is 1 minus alpha bar z over 1 minus alpha bar z. And so I get alpha times 1 minus alpha bar z minus alpha plus z all over 1 minus alpha bar z minus alpha <coughs> plus, I mean, it's minus, I think, alpha bar alpha, right? Minus alpha bar alpha and then plus alpha bar z. What did you do here? I just multiplied by 1 minus alpha bar z over 1 minus alpha bar z. Okay, so let's just multiply everything on the numerator. I get alpha minus alpha alpha bar z minus alpha plus z divided by 1 minus alpha bar z. Oh, wait a minute. I'm multiplying by... Okay. I think you have too many bars yep. in the... I'm the sorry? <laughs> alpha bar, alpha bar? Yeah, is that correct? Mm -hmm. just no. Alpha bar, alpha. alpha. It should be alpha bar, alpha. Yeah. Yes. So I get 1 minus alpha bar z minus alpha, alpha bar plus alpha bar z. I have alpha minus alpha cancels. Does anything else cancel? I have a minus alpha bar z, and I have a plus alpha bar z. So I'm left with z minus alpha alpha bar z, and down below I have a 1 minus alpha alpha bar. Mm -hmm. And now what happens? That is z. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's defective. Clearly. Clearly. I, this is worth some excitement. It is. You're just like my kids. <laughs> uh, right. I, I have to. <laughs> <laughs> so Kim has decided he would rather have cash now for doing math problems. Oh really? Than than yes. He's smart. And so he's <laughs> learning. Yes. Unfortunately, he's. He doesn't quite understand the difference between a penny and a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, future Cam. Okay. Um, what did we just show? It's its own inverse. It's C alpha equals C alpha inverse. We're not going to get to the Schwartz lemma today, but you know, to continue the space ball lemma, it's its own best friend. Right? It's its own inverse. How many maps do you know that are their own inverse? Infinitely. <laughs> Infinitely many now. Right? You can be any alpha, and now you have plenty of money. Before today, can you give me a map that's its own inverse? F of z equals z. F of z equals z. Anything else? <laughs> so can you give me infinitely many? Or are we just stuck with just those two? Or what about 1 over z? Does that work? <coughs> is, it its own, is it its own inverse? Yeah, you just have to restrict the space you study. You, know, you can't include 0, but yes. You know, 1 over z is its own inverse. Minus z is its own inverse. Z is its own inverse. Are those special cases of these maps? If you take alpha equals 0, what do you get? Minus z. Alright, so at least minus z is a special case here. 
1 over z you're not going to get from a map like this. Okay. We've just found infinitely many maps that are their own inverse. Okay. So now the question is we want to show that this map takes the unit disk to what? We want to show it takes the unit disk to the unit disk. So how do we do the algebra to show that this takes the unit disk to the unit disk? So we want to show C alpha maps the disk to the disk. What could we try to do? We can map the boundary to the boundary. <laughs> okay, so one thing is to say, well, what happens if the absolute value of z is 1? It doesn't map boundary to boundary. So we could try looking at that, but I want to point inside. We do what we did before. Fix w in d. Find z in d such that alpha minus z over 1 minus alpha bar z is w. And then just go through all the argument as before. And so you get alpha minus z is w minus alpha bar z w. So we bring things over. And we get alpha minus w is, we bring z over here, we get 1 minus alpha bar times z. Hmm? Minus alpha bar times z. If I bring z over, right, is this correct? Oh, wait, oh, there's a w here. No, it's alpha bar w times z. And so solving for z, we get z is alpha minus w over 1 minus alpha bar w. Well, this is, of course, <laughs> just show us the inverse. So, like, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. so I mean, I'm saying this shouldn't be too surprising. Right? You're trying to find a point that's mapped to w. Oh, here's the point to try. Because now, c alpha of z is C alpha of C alpha of W, which is just W. So why is this not a proof? Because you didn't show it in the unit disk. Oh, I'm sorry? You didn't show it in the unit disk. Yeah, we didn't show it was in the unit disk. Right? I can't just use this to not conclude that everything is fine. I need to show that this expression is in the unit disk. Okay? So in the interest of time, I will not go into the details that this is in the unit disk, you can refer to the book for the rest of the calculation. You can look at, you know, sizes. What might help you in trying to understand if this is mapping to the unit disk? One split into real or imaginary part. That's more for upper half plane, unfortunately. So what could I do to show that this is in the uh, unit disk? Is the magnitude less than one? Ah, uh, good. So if I can show that this maps the boundary of the circle to the boundary of the circle, then what what result could I then use? Max, Max modulus. modulus. So this is why we're developing all of these, well, this is why we developed all those machineries earlier. So I could then use Max Modulus. So you've got to be very careful. It's tempting to just say, well, yeah, take C, take Z to be C alpha of W. That's begging the question. So I'll end with the following calculation. And I might have shown this to some of you in the past. Calc review. All right, if, you've, if, I've, if you've seen this with me before, don't answer. What's the limit as x goes to 0 of sine of x over x? Okay, 1. So how did you calculate this? L'Hopital. So by L'Hopital, this is the limit as x goes to 0 of cosine of x over 1, which is 1. Now the problem is to use L'Hopital's rule, you need to know what the derivative of sine is. How do you calculate the derivative of sine? You need that limit. So you can't use L'Hopital's rule here unless you can independently prove that the derivative of sine is cosine. You've got to be very careful about arguing in circles, and are you using something before you prove it? <coughs> so we can't just invoke L'Hopital's rule. Because when you're calculating the derivative of sine, you know, sine prime of 0 is the limit as h goes to 0 
of sine of 0 plus h minus the sine of 0 over h. Well, the sine of 0 is 0, just let h equal x. Okay, so just things to be careful about. So for Friday's class, we will get